Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode two in our Humans of Education podcast. So fortunate to have Mark Rivard on the show to share his passion and enthusiasm for experiential learning. And we're going to go deep on everything he's doing to drive his mission to impact students through art, through the culinary arts, and all of his brands and work in pursuit of that passion. This is an amazing episode. I was so happy after it was done that we just got so deep on all of these topics. I hope you guys enjoy it and let us know what you think. Leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, guys, episode two of the Humans of Education podcast. Super stoked to have Mark Rivard on the show today. He's doing so many cool things that I just want to help spread that message to anyone that will listen to kind of see you know, what he's doing, how he's doing it, and how he is inspiring students and everyone around him. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, I am. I've been following you for a long time on social media and just excited to dive deep, like I said, before we started recording and to see kind of where you've come from, what you're doing, and then, you know, what's your why behind all of that? You know, when I look at your social media, um, you're an artist, you're a writer, you're a cook, you're a public speaker, you're an art educator, you're a founder of multiple different companies and nonprofits. Man, yeah. you're doing so many things, which is you know, you're a man of my, I cut, we're cut from the same cloth that we want to do a thousand different things. We have this big why of impact, I think. And, you know, you're just trying to figure out any way possible to do that. So I want to start with your background. How did you end up working with students in education? Tell us what we need to hear. Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, an incredibly long story, but the, the gist of it is I, I was, um, I, I started off kind of illustrating skateboards with Sharpie markers, believe it or not, just, uh, um, and it came off of a, a ski injury, like right out of high school, I moved to Colorado, I was a ski bum and just doing that whole thing and uh, um, had a pretty horrific knee injury. So I had a, a, a knee surgery back in Minneapolis where I'm from, and, um, you know, just had to kind of rethink life and, and figure out what I wanted to do. That was about to 23, 24 years old ish, you know, that kind of year time frame where I was sort of laid up and not really able to do much physical activity, physical work, things like that. So, um, right. resorted back to just the creative things I was interested in as a kid and as a student. And, uh, that, that was obviously arts and those types of things, but it was never something that I thought would be a job or something I could do for a living. Um, but when I, when I first picked up uh, skateboards and illustration and stuff like that and just kind of drawing on skateboards, it was just, at the time for me, it was just something to fill the headspace, you know, just, just something to, to kind of, you know, an art therapy, honestly. It was just something to occupy my mind. And um, I, there's a natural born entrepreneur in me that just sort of started to come out of that where I looked at art shows and promoting my artwork and, you know, getting into skate shops and things like that. And eventually that built into a brand where I had uh, started a skateboard company. I was pushing to be in galleries and I was doing art shows kind of all over the world and was getting a, a bit of a name art wise and uh, kind of building into that realm. And um, somehow finally corralled that into an endorsement deal with Sharpie markers where I actually took the concept of skateboarding and skiing and snowboarding, surfing, things like that. And, you know, used that sponsorship idea. And I pitched that nonstop to Sharpie once I had some contacts there and, uh, that eventually led to a 2011 ad campaign called Starts with Sharpie, um, where I was in all of their commercials and ads. And they did a little mini documentary on YouTube about kind of my life story and how I created a business through Sharpie markers. And, um, you know, they, they put a really Hollywood dramatic twist on things just to kind of put it out there on a on an international marketing scale. And, um, uh, and that led to speaking in schools. And, you know, the, the very first school that I ever had any interaction with was an elementary school in Woodbury, Minnesota. Um, and a teacher had emailed me and said that, uh, the, the art room had all of the, the tables in the art room were kind of named after different artists. There was a Van Gogh table, a Warhol table, the Frida table and so on. And, and she had like six tables in her art room. And one of them was the Mark Rivard table. That's awesome. And I was blown away by this. I was like, that's insane. How did in the world did this happen? And she said, we wanted to name one after a local artist because Woodbury is a suburb of Minneapolis. And uh, 
Um, and she asked if I would come and meet the kids. And so I, of course said, yeah, I'd be honored. And, and we ended up having a conversation about it. And I was like, what if I come for five straight days and we have all of the kids draw on a skateboard? So all of her classes throughout a full week, their project was to collaborate on one skateboard. And um, I do a lot of skyline artwork. So we all did a skyline together. I had each kid draw one building of the skyline. Um, and so by the end of it, we had five skateboards for all of her different classes. And, uh, and, and the seed was planted. At, at that point, I, was, I, I had had a taste of education, the kids, the energy. It just was like, this feels like something I, I, I could pursue. And, and, you know, the one thing that I always kind of go back to is, um, you know, when you have an opportunity like I had with Sharpie in 2011, where, where you really are experiencing sort of your 15 minutes and, uh, and, and really, you know, you, you've got some opportunities coming your way. It's like, what happens with that? You, you know, it's going to end, you know, that contract's going to end. And, and, and what do you do with the momentum that you have built at that point? And um, that was something that, that quite frankly, scared the hell out of me. I was like, man, this is all going to be over in a bit. Right. And then what? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right. when I found education, I was like, this is the most meaningful thing I can possibly do. And if I can take this experience and be able to continually uh, uh, bring that message into schools and classrooms, which is where I think it belonged, um, you know, it just seemed like the most symbiotic natural fit. And uh, I was like, this is, this is where I got to go with this. This is where I got to take this. And of course, Sharpie loved it. They, they've been very supportive. Um, you know, obviously that's a pretty positive spin to a, you know, another little added element to an ad campaign. So right. Yeah, that's how I got into education. Awesome, man. I love the not straightforward progress into education. You know, there's so many educators that are high school to college. I want to be a teacher. I go through that. I get out. I do student or yeah, graduate school, student teaching right into, right into the classroom. And there's a lot of that singular perspective. And there's nothing wrong with that perspective. Like they have just as much impact, right? But I love seeing different stories that students can be influenced by and impacted by to see there's not one route to get anywhere, right? Because we all come from different places and students need that variety. And I love seeing that. So tell me, where, where was your connection to art? So obviously, you know, you're, you're a snowboard bum. Has art always been in your life? Were you always drawing and painting? Or what was that like for you when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah. You know what? It's funny. I can, I can specifically remember the instance that, that art sort of stood out in my head as, as, as a thing, you know, and it was right. third grade. I remember it quite well. Um, uh, learning about Vincent van Gogh, um, just as a kid, the story of Vincent van Gogh, the ear, everything was just like, as a kid, that was just crazy to me. You know, my yeah. mind was blown by this idea. And I know we went on a field trip um, when I was in elementary school, we went to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts where uh, van Gogh's olive tree painting is at. And, physically seeing that painting in its, you know, having a real actual physical presence with that painting, something clicked. And I, and I can think back on this uh, to this day. And my mom loves to remind me of this. I, after that experience, I would sit out on the deck all summer and try and paint. And, and I was always like calling myself as a little third grade kid. I'm Vincent van Gogh. And love <laughs> That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that was it. And, and then it, it just sort of was, it was just something, it was never like I was incredibly talented at it or anything like that. I never felt like I was the best artist in school or anything, but, but I understood it and I could get A's in art. So if I could fail math, I could ace drawing and, and that could kind of balance out my grade point average. And I would, uh, I'd be able to make it through high school. Really. It's my only goal was to get out of high school. Um, and, uh, and if I could use those creative classes, all of them, you know, I, I did well in English. I did well in photography. I did well in painting and drawing. And, uh, and then uh, and athletics obviously was, was a good one for me as well. But then I was horrible in science and math and, and things like that. And so there, I, 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 could, I, I knew there was a balance there. And, and so that's when I kind of realized, like, there's a benefit to art. I, I, there's something about having this ability that's beneficial to me. It's going to get me through high school. So um, whether you understand at that point where it can go, you know, obviously nobody in high school tells you that you can be an artist for a living. Like, right. That's what I was just thinking. Yeah. So yeah nobody think... tells you, you could draw for a living or you could do this for a living or anything like that. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we, we probably tell our students they have a better chance of being LeBron James than a famous painter. So, um, absolutely. And maybe they do, who knows? It's, it's, it's not easy. It, you know, the, to think of the art world. And, and this is a problem I think we have is that we, we try to tell 
we, we create this image in the art world that, that it is a lot like superstar athletics or pop singers or something like that. And it's not, there's nothing about the art world. I think in my opinion, that, 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 that is the, the correct way to approach a career, a creative career, what, right. whatever the medium, you know? Um, but yeah, going back to like, it, it was honestly third grade. I just, I, I, I enjoyed art. I, it was just something I enjoyed to do. And, I feel very fortunate that I went to school in a time before the internet. Um, You know, I was kind of on that tail end of, of, of the civilization that will know the world before the internet as kids. Um, You know, internet really started clicking when I was in high school and it, for me, it didn't click till I was like 25. I I don't even, I didn't even have an email address till I was 25 years old. Uh, And so, you know, that, that's helpful because a lot of kids I think are forced to be you know, creative in different ways, not more creative, but just creative in different ways. Um, And physically sitting down with a drawing or a painting or something, it's just something that we did, I think a little bit more of back then. So. um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember those times. Um, I think we're probably around similar age. Um, And it wasn't until college that just like things really changed or really post-college that the world is just a completely different place. But I want to go back to, your talk about your personal experience in high school and how you, you struggled in certain topics, but you were just, you felt comfortable and you were thriving in others, art, you know, English, you know, mm-hmm. kind of the, the arts, if you will, you know, how can we give that message to educators currently who might traditionally just think, and I think there's a lot of them out there that just traditionally think, you know, that brilliance in education and success in school are those core focus topics and forget to realize that like music and art and like all these other things can be just as brilliant. And in today's time, yeah. you know, maybe even easier or more likely to find success because it just takes one video on a social media platform or one drawing to really change someone's life. How do we get other educators to see that in students and encourage them and inspire them? Like, Hey, it's okay that you don't know advanced calculus in high school or whatever it may be, but you are an amazing artist. Like how do we get that message to the education world? I think we got a cross breed curriculum. It's a matter of, it's absolutely a matter. When I, when I'm teaching art, I am talking about math constantly. Um, when I'm, when I'm working on a skateboard with a student, we're talking about proportions, geometry, perspective. We're talking about science. We're talking about math. Um, you know, I've, I've written a lot of a curriculum for steam and STEM programs. Um, and, and we're talking about business. We're talking about these things all the time. And, and I think, the art side of things has to do a better job of acknowledging the practical stuff and the practical side of things has to do a better job of acknowledging the creative stuff. Cause the two are, the two are, they, they work together. Well, it's Absolutely. one of um, And it, I had a really interesting experience with a student. Actually the first air force base I ever visited was uh, Altus air force base down in Oklahoma. And um, uh, one of the things I've learned about military students, I've worked a lot over the last four or five years with, um, with, with students on military bases and kids that are literally, re- quite literally are born on base and have lived their entire lives in sort of a military structured family and things like that. And, and one of the threads, right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, is, is that what the theme or constant that I see with a lot of those students that are in that scenario is that um, they have a harder time embracing the creative side of things. Uh, because it's such a regimented lifestyle and it's, um, and so the student was just like, I'm just not creative. I don't, you know, I don't know how to come up with ideas and so on. And one of the, you know, it, it occurred to me, like we were looking at these F-16s taken off on the flight line for literally from where we were drawing. And I was like, it took an artist to think of that. Like, that's a creative person that thinks we could probably make that thing go up in the air. Like, right this is a concept that embodies science and technology and math and all of these things, but also, the idea, the idea that it's possible is absolutely an artist concept. I mean, that's something an artist created. Um, yeah. Be, being a veteran, I don't know if you knew that about me, but a, a veteran of the Marine Corps, like there's not yeah. much creativity they allow. <laughs> and it, and I, it definitely goes, obviously parents who are in the military live that lifestyle. And I definitely think that's, that's something I never thought of. And that's really fun, cool to see that you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to talk more about that offline and see, see how we can help with that. But um, Absolutely. yeah, I, I think that cross cross pollinization of 
curriculum is key. Something, you know, me being from the fitness world, when I was work, working with clients in the gym, we were always talking about math and, you know, science and the things that go into how you move your body that they don't even think about. And I'm like, these things, they, they matter, they work together. So I, I love that idea. You know, one of your um, Instagram lives you were doing, I think when quarantine first started, I pulled a quote from it and it was, you're not a how to educator. You're a, you can educator. Talk to me about that and kind of what that means. Uh, you know, it, at the time, well, what I started doing immediately in the quarantine, um, after, after the panic was over and I was like, okay, now I figure out a way to make a living because, you know, hundred percent of the business went away. Um, so I was going to do these online programs where I was teaching skateboard art online. And, and, and I realized that what I teach isn't necessarily like step-by-step how to art, you know, that's just not what I'm there to do. I'm not there to teach you how to paint technically or to draw technically. That's part of it. It's part of the conversation. But I think the reason that my programs have any degree of success is because it's a far larger message than strictly drawing and painting and things like that. Um, and it's, it's about what you can do and how to explore and exploit opportunity. And, and I say the word exploit a lot and, and I, and, and I'll, it comes with this negative kind of tone and it's, it's the word exploit is not a negative thing. Like that to me, I exploited Sharpie for these opportunities. I went every single opportunity. I exploited my, my platform with Sharpie to my advantage, you know? Yep. Um, and we need to learn how to do that positively. You know, so that's kind of one of the bigger messages, I think, with with when I'm talking with kids is like, yeah, you're drawing on a skateboard right now, but I don't have any anticipation that any of those students are going to go on to become career skateboard artists. I mean, that's that's completely unrealistic. Right. We're digging into what you're passionate about. We're digging into what you're interested in. We're digging into how you tell your story. And so it's less about like whether you can shade a circle perfectly to make us you know, a sphere, it's more about why and what kind of message are you trying to say? What sort of story are you trying to tell? Um, whenever I'm speaking at schools, I, I, I sit here with my skateboards. And, you know, I, I, I don't tell you about how I drew this. I tell you about why I drew it. Um, right. You know, and this one is obviously this is a, this is my very first skateboard ever. This is the first board that I ever drew. That's um, so cool. Old skateboard that I skated my whole life as a kid. I bought this with probably in the 90s and <laughs> uh, so you know and, and and that's part of it is i talk about not how i drew it but why i drew it right um so you know that kind of goes back to that idea yeah i think you know everyone's got a story and i just think a lot of people aren't willing to tell it or aren't willing to do maybe the deep dive into their motivations and why they're doing things. And, and you know, long, long, long tail off of that, I think is why we, we struggle so much with mental and emotional health is that we're not digging into like what we're actually passionate about to do. And if you look at society, like everything we love, whether it's movies or sports or, you know, art, whatever, whatever. Oh, here goes my notes. Um, everything has a story, right? And we get tied into that story, whether it's like the hero's journey or the struggle. And you know, I just love that that's part of that experiential learning yeah. that you're creating. And I think it's so powerful. Like, you know, I'm a visual or kinesthetic learner. Like if I'm not doing it, like I, I'm getting nothing out of it. Like you could talk to me all day, but like I need to feel and understand what's going on. Yeah. So I love that idea, man. Tell me how that experiential learning has now turned in for you as like the entrepreneur that I love seeing and to do rad things, which you're rocking the brand. Yeah. I got, I got mine right here. I'm NASCAR. But, uh, I'm a- <laughs> <laughs> the sponsored athlete for sure. Um, you've got such cool products and such a cool idea behind that. And I love it being a traveler and like yeah. someone who likes being outdoors. I love that brand. And then also into stage culinary. So if you've got cooking going on as well, tell me how, you know, that you can educator goes into experiential learning into these brands and what you're doing with them. I know that's, yeah. like, that's like 12 questions in one, but right. Yeah. No, well, um, it's, it kind of started with like, it goes back to the, the very, you know, that first educational experience where I thought to myself, like, instead of me just speaking, as I was getting a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, during the Sharpie era and post Sharpie to come and just just to strictly speak, just to kind of come and be, you know, motivational or inspirational speaker, which I, I hate that term. I'm not a, 
I, I don't like considering myself that at all. Um, and, and I always, I always went back to why well, just listen to me. I like, I have, we have the Sharpies, we have the skateboards. I have the access to bring all of your kids, these things. Let's do it together. Like, let's actually, I want to hear their stories. You know, yeah. I can tell you my story all day long, but it, what's that doing for you? Hopefully it inspires you a little bit, but also why not you tell me yours too? Like, let's make this a dialogue instead of just a speech. And so that's kind of what I was trying to do. And, uh, and then that lead, leads into so many different things. I mean, from there, for me, it was skateboards and, and, and illustration. You know, obviously that was the, the, the natural progression of that. But um, I always look back at my, my early years. I worked in restaurants. I bartended for like 17 years. And I was a fan of, of the culinary world, the food and beverage world and things like that. And, and there's such, a, there's such a, a learning opportunity there as well. And, and it sort of occurred to me one day when I was talking, I worked at a really, really amazing restaurant in Minneapolis. Uh, the last place that I worked at in the food and, ser and service industry, it was a, a restaurant called Heyday. And uh, the chef there was just this incredible chef and he was a great guy, a friend of mine. And, uh, and we were chatting one night and it just sort of clicked. And I was like, your story's incredible. You could, I could take this mold of skateboard art that I've created, this exact skeleton of a curriculum, transplant it to the culinary world and it'll be your story and your cooking. And you know, the success of this is your restaurant. And let's teach the kids how to do what you've done. And, and uh, just we're just going to create this skeleton of experiential learning and transport it into this other industry. And, um, and, and we went for it and it worked. And, and that's where Stodge Culinary ended up kind of coming from. Um, and then, you know, a year later, I went back to try and do that again with another high school here in the Twin Cities and went on a much larger scale. I hooked up with the restaurants and, uh, you know, hired a chef and some, and, and some, and some management that kind of came in and helped with that. And, and uh, we really upgraded it to like a 20 kid program. And then that was like a full semester where the students really did a full takeover and a full menu development. And it was incredible. I mean, it was just such an awesome opportunity, but again, it goes back to not only like the one thing I always said is this is not home ec. Like we are not teaching you home ec. <laughs> this, arts. this is high end business. Yep. There's real loss. There's real profit to be made. We can screw this up. And I think that's really important too. When you put that pressure on a student and you put that pressure on a whole team, the students are forced to work together with that restaurant, with the chef, with myself. Um, you know, we all have to lean on each other as a team to kind of come up with a final product and actually make this thing work. Uh, right. And so I, I, I'm, I'm running off track here, but uh, yeah. No, it's, it's great. It's great. Yeah, it, I love it. It was, it was an amazing experience and that's where it sort of stemmed from. And, and the word stage itself is a French term for a culinary apprentice. And so I'm always about brands as well. Like yep. any project that I'm working on, like it, it, it's easier to explain something through a brand. And, and so I decided, you know, like Stodge Culinary is this offshoot of the Rivard Art educational stuff that I had been doing. So uh, the word Stodge seemed to really work. I loved it. Stodge Culinary it was more of a high value, creative, artistic endeavor than it was a cooking school. And so yep. um, we put all those together. But then that, that also ties back into like, to, to bring it back to like all of the other, uh, uh, like the, the blending of curriculums and, and styles of education through this program, we're learning health and nutrition. We're learning business. We're learning the cost of food. We're learning how to, how to exploit a chicken to feed a family and how to, you know, do all of these different things. So they're learning, they're learning an art form. They're being very creative. They're talking about their cultures. They're plating a dish in a beautiful way. They're learning the business of it. Um, they're learning the health and nutrition of it. They're learning how to provide for their communities and their families. And it's all of these things that are coming together under one very, very uh, intense and immersive experience. And the students loved it. I mean, yeah, we had three of those students that went on to work for the restaurant. Oh, they have to in and getting job placement off of this as well. So this is, um, you know, I think we checked a lot of the boxes at, and, and I, I was really, really proud of that. Man, that is, that is a beautiful representation of experiential learning, like life changing, covering so many things that will stick with a student forever and showing them that, Hey, again, and I'm, I'm so big on this. And I think you would agree, uh, based on your background, it's like, there's no one way that leads to success. It's not school and then college and then career in a cubicle and all these things. Like there are so many things that you can do and you can find your passion and be happy doing these things, if that's, you know, the food and beverage industry or art or whatever it may be like in teaching that entrepreneurial spirit, which I think is going to 
is going to be more necessary moving forward than ever before based on technology and like a lot of the jobs that are out there are going to be going away. So like, how are you using your story, your experience, your passion to create something of value for everyone else? Like, I just think that's such a cool, such a cool story. Are there, are there plans for the future to continue that once obviously the world is, the world is changing, but (laughs) yeah. 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 And just real quick to note, when you said to add value, that's, um, that's, that's something I talk a lot about. I have a, I have a thing I call the $10,000 question. I, whenever I have a student that's sort of stuck and they don't have, they can't figure out what they want to draw on their skateboard or depending on what we're doing, you know, I, I have this $10,000 question that I always present to kids. And it's a, if I gave you 10 grand cash, here you go. It's $10,000 cash, spend it on anything you want, but it can't be a material thing. Like we're not talking X games boxes or a new chain or something like that. Right. Spend this $10,000 in a way that adds value to your life or your family's life, or how do you, what are you going to do with this? And you can spend it selfishly. You could travel, you could do whatever. Um, How do we add value to your life? What would you do to add value to your life? How do you get a return on this $10,000 in a way that's going to benefit you? Um, And that gets the wheels spinning in the student's mind about what am I passionate about? How would I, you know, depending on how they answer that question, we automatically have created a path towards what they're interested in. And, and now we can start to dig into what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so add value is awesome. I mean, I, 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 I talk about that all the time. How are we yeah. adding value, exploiting opportunities, adding value? These are huge, huge components that when you learn how to harness that, you open yourself up to so much in the world. There's so much. Yeah, you can do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I forgot the, the, the basis of that question, but that, that sentence really struck me. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I love it. Yeah, it's great. I, that's definitely a question. I wrote that down. Um, I think one, a lot of teachers could use that when yeah. maybe they're struggling with a student to get yeah. them motivated or passionate about something, but also like how many adults do we know that could, <laughs> that, that would love that question, especially now, like $10,000 yeah. could go a long way if you need it. Um, like, what would you do with it? I don't know. That's a great, I mean, I'll put that question in my podcast for future guests. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and it, it, it seems to work, you know, you get yeah. a lot of, you get a lot of like blank stares and then you get some deep thought and then eventually an answer comes out. And it's like, and, and I, I like to ask the question because there was a point in my life where I, I had a job that a, a creative gig that I, that I landed that at the time it was the highest paying thing I'd ever done. And it was 10 grand. And that's where the number came from. And, and I was like a young artist starting off in my career. And I was like, this is the most amazing thing in the world. And I took my money. I bought skateboards. I bought into some studio space. And that's, I bought the website for Rivard Art Education. That's really the seed money that started my educational side of things. Um, you know, that's where I was able to kind of go out and, you know, get the websites going and things like that. All the stuff, it, not to go super deep business, but all of it costs a ton of money before you see any return. And um, absolutely, you know, that, I looked at that as like, okay, what can I do with this? And then I traveled. I, I'm a yeah. huge component, a huge fan of travel. I, yeah. I, well, there is never a moment where I'm going to tell somebody that travel is a bad idea. Like travel is always going to add value to your life, no matter what. Absolutely. You, you will always, you will, you will always have those, those experiences will always benefit you in a better way, no matter what that happens or whatever, you know, um, travel is a big one for me. So yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I want to give some takeaways before we get to like the final couple questions I have for educators. And I think this experiential learning is just such a valuable tool that, so many students are missing right now in their education K through 12, which is predominantly who is going to listen to this. So what was the process like, you know, how did you find a school that wanted to work with you, whether it be the art program or, you know, what would you recommend to a teacher that wants to do something like, you know, the culinary piece, like how could they approach a restaurant? Obviously you had some credibility from, you know, your artwork and working in schools before, but like how, how can they go about doing that? What do you recommend? Just like pull the trigger or you know, what do you think? Well, I mean, be bold about going out and approaching too. Um, but one of the biggest things in the world is your network. I mean, networking yep. is, um, and, and, and a lot of, sometimes that comes off as a cheesier term, but uh, it's organic networking, I would say. I, I'm not a big fan of like going to a conference and try to meet people to exchange business cards or something like that. Like that, that you have cool, to have cool name tags. and Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and for me, um, I was really lucky. I had, I had an actual, uh, I, I, not lucky. It's not luck. I worked and built these things and did them very intentionally, but, uh, um, 
I happen to draw on skateboards. We freaking cool. Kids yeah. like them. It was an easy sell. It's so it's like, you know, <laughs> and um, and then we, you know when when Sharpie happened and I had kind of that documentary to fall back on and stuff like that. I instantly had a built-in marketing machine that right. was made it quite easy for me to start approaching these things. The connection for me, you know, the hard part for me was learning how to be a teacher, learning how to understand education, how to kind of navigate through the oops of education. Um, and, and, and sort of figuring out how does that work and how do you, you know, how do you approach schools and so on. And, and fortunately, I didn't have to do a lot of approaching. I've, I've very, very rarely ever gone out and pitched this program or any of my programs. It's something that's always sort of organically happened. Yeah. Word of mouth, it, it just, it's worked. And that's what's, um, that's, you know, that's a very fortunate aspect of this for me is that I didn't have to sell it too hard. I, it, I sort of built it out of necessity because there was a need for it. Um, you know, the more opportunities I had in school, the more schools kept calling. And so all of these things just kind of built up. And before I knew it, I was working in education before I ever even thought of myself as an educator. Um, so that's, that's a fortunate thing. But for me, I had skateboards and, and skateboards are cool. And that yeah. makes a huge difference. And so um, yeah, you kind of have to look at your resources a little bit and say, what, yeah. what's, what's sellable about what I'm trying to do? And then yeah. hone in on that. I think maybe the message is to educational leadership because I mean, a little of my story, all of this started from me getting one opportunity to run an after school program for mm -hmm. health, fitness, nutrition at a local middle school. And literally, it took me visiting almost every middle and high school in my district. And there's 88 schools in the district, if that gives you any idea. Like, it's huge. Yeah. And getting every single no. Hey, we'll, we'll give you a call, like no replies, like, and I'm walking in just like, Hey, I want to run an after school program. Like, and for years I was, it was, it was hundred percent free. I just want to partner or we can like somehow mm -hmm. get, get students to my, to my gym that I owned and we can run a free program, you know, just to give them more experience with health and wellness. And it was mm -hmm. like, no, 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 no. But I think the, the message for leaders perhaps from this is like, there's so many educators, maybe not with the title in your local community. It's so like be willing to partner, be willing to try something new and give opportunities to students that they may never have mm -hmm. um, inside the walls of the school. Right. And that's why like these programs excite me so much. Like I just love seeing it. It's awesome. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of times too, we don't, we don't put enough emphasis on the vehicle and the vehicle for me was the skateboard, of course. And like um, the vehicle with Stodge Culinary is the food. Uh, yep. You know, these are things that, that kids are inherently interested in. Like, let's look at what kids are interested in. Yep. And if, if the goal is to teach health and wellness, things of that nature, uh, let's find the right vehicle to kind of engage the students first. Um, and then we also have to remember, like, a, a lot of times educators didn't, you know, a lot of people that are, that are full-time teachers and principals and things like that, um, they're not there to make money. They're not there to, it's, it's, it's not in their, it's not in the forefront of their mind to come up with the best business strategy here. So you, I, I find that it, it's really, I walk a fine line of all the time of like, I have to operate a business. I have to create and generate a profit for me to live and things like that, you know, but I also have to remember that my primary goal is if the education isn't top notch, if my experience with the students isn't the best it can possibly be, my product isn't very good. Right. And so, um, you know, that's on, that's on the person pitching the program not on the educator. It's not the principal's responsibility to see that. It's your responsibility to make sure that's happening and make sure that that, that vehicle is presenting itself in a way that makes them want to say, yeah, let's engage with this. And this is, looks like it could be very promising. So um, part of that is making it cool. Do rad things, stodge culinary, skateboards, you know, make your brands, make your, make your ideas really, really sing, make them really hip, make them culturally interesting. Um, you know, Kids are interested, and I have the advantage of having spent a lot of time with a lot of different students all over the world, and and, and really having you know being in skateboarding, I kind of have this plug into uh, youth culture and things like that. So right. there's an advantage to that, but but that's kind of the point is like you have to kind of really massage the vehicle, you know, make sure that you're that, that whatever it is you're trying to pitch, the the end goal is the educational value of that, but also is it interesting. Do the kids right. want to come? You know, if they don't want to be there, it's not going to be successful. Right. Yeah. There's no point. Yeah. So I want to get to a couple questions that I ask a lot of the guests on this type of show. Um, 
just kind of spur some thought and see what we get from you. So the first one, what is a topic not taught in education that should be taught in every single school? Not taught in education, but should be taught in every single school. Oh man, oh, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was say there's probably more than one. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. You only, you um, only get one. Only get one. Oh. Yep. Oh, that's uh, not taught in education, but should be taught in every school. One topic. And this is a great question for someone who's not from an education background. This is great. Yeah, absolutely, it is. That's um, um, intellectual property. Tell me more. I'm going to say intellectual property. This is, and, and what I mean by that is teaching kids the value of their mind and teaching students um, how to value themselves. As we talk about building entrepreneurs and things like that, and I totally agree the world is going to go to an entrepreneurial place. I think even today, even if you're working a nine to five and you're working from home, you're ultimately running your own business. Right. If you don't show up and turn on that Zoom meeting, you're not going to have a job. So in a weird way, you are an entrepreneur. I used to tell, I, I trained a lot of bartenders in my life and I would tell bartenders all the time, like, this is your real estate. Think of yourself as a real estate agent, not as a bartender. It's your job to make this the best real estate in the city. Yep. You want people here. And think of it like that. It, 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 if that's your personality, if that's the, the, the best drink you can make, the food, whatever it is, use your tools to make that the best piece of real estate in the city. Um, and so that's intellectual property. And I, you know, I, I tell kids this all the time. Like I, I have a job today because I have intellectual property. I created things of value from my mind. That's what an artist does. Yeah. Um, you know, an artist is somebody that, that can tell a story through a visual or through their words or whatever the case may be. Um, when you buy a book, you're buying that intellectual property of that author. You know, you're not paying for the paper, you're paying for the information. And so, yeah. um, intellectual property. I think if we put a lot of value on what that is, that could be a huge just shift in mindset and uh, kids need to know how to value themselves. Yeah. I love that we can tie in bartending into education for teachers. Cause I think if a teacher took that same mindset of like, yeah. this is my real estate, my classroom is my real estate. I need to make yeah. this the most valuable real estate in this school, kids are dying to get into my classroom. Like yeah. that, that should be the goal. I, you know what? I, I, I had a Harvard business degree in bartending. It was, uh, <laughs> I, I, that's a, it, it's a hell of a school. And, uh, oh, absolutely. Lot, you know, and, and, uh, if you want a, qu a quick communication degree, become a bartender. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yep. <laughs> uh, next question. If you were going to give a Ted talk, what would the title be? Ah, Ted talk. I'd love to do one of those, man. <laughs> I, th I think you definitely have. We should get you in TEDx immediately. Yeah, I would love it. I would love it. That would be a dream. Those are, I, I, I watch a lot of them. And um, what would my topic be? A TED Talk? Oh, boy. Oh, man. I, oh, there's so many. I mean, I could cherry pick about 15 different things and probably make a TED Talk out of that. But uh, you give, me the, give me the title of the TED Talk. Passion. Passion. Love I'd it. say passion. I would make a, I would make a TED talk about passion. And, um, you know, I think uh, not everything you do in your life is irrelevant if you're not passionate about it. And, um, you know, that's, I was passionate about all the things that I did. And then when I met kids and started doing educational work, I became extremely passionate about that. Yep. And I don't think I realized how much that meant to me until I had the opportunity to be in front of kids. And, um, and again, that was an opportunity that I never saw coming, but like, when I think back at my entire life, like I've always been sort of protective of the kids in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, I spent, I spent a summer one summer working at a skate park and I remember a little kid getting picked on by an older grumpier skateboarder. And I had a fight with that skateboarder with the big guy. Cause he was uh, really picking on a little kid. And it's like, yeah. Hey, this, this is, this space is for him. You know, this space yeah. is for the kid to learn and enjoy and, and, you know, learn how to interact with his, with, with, with his classmates and with his, co you know, not colleagues with the, you know, fellow kids in the community and so yeah. on and you know um and, and 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 that tied into the idea that i've always been passionate about uh about about kids like you know making sure that the kids are safe and protected and then you know education i never in a million years would have thought that'd be something i'd be doing i swore i'd never step foot in my high school again the day i left <laughs> here i am you know and uh you know um so finding things you're passionate about you know it just so happened that I drew on a skateboard because I was passionate about art and I was passionate yep. about skateboarding and the two 
simultaneously created a whole new world for me. So without yeah. passion, you're not going to get too far if you're not passionate about something. So yeah, I love it. Man. Perfect answer. Last <laughs> but not least, when your work is done in education, what does the world of education look like when your work is complete? Not saying that it ever will be, but your kind of moonshot goal, what, what changes, what, what will the world of education look like when your work is done? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely won't ever be, but, uh, I, man, I, you know, I think it goes back to like, it goes back, you know, it goes back to passion and intellectual property. Really. It's, um, you know, you see students coming out of, out of growing into adults, you know, I, I don't even know that I necessarily agree with those school systems set up as it is. Um, education is going to look so different, I think in the future, it already yep. does in, in what is it? Six months since the pandemic started. Yep. The world of education is 180 degrees different than it was six months ago. Right. So, you know, I think my, my, my greatest hope would be that students are all sort of looking at the things that engage them and then finding ways to kind of add value to those things, you know, and yep. then learning all of the necessary skills as we go. Of course, we have to sit down and we have to learn how to spell. And we have to learn how to read and write and add and subtract and things like that. We can't just assume that Google's going to do it all for us. We do need those core things. There's, right. There are aspects of education that I agree we never, ever can go anywhere. Um, a lot of that boils down to as well, just, you know, what you're learning at home and so on and so forth. And um, what does it look like in the future? I think it becomes very specialized and very unique to each individual. And I think that's possible. I, I really do. I think that especially when you get into the older ages, you know, high school and things like that, uh, you know, we can't expect a sixth grader to know what they want to do for the rest of their life. I think that question's ridiculous. Um, right. It changes obviously so much, but uh, uh, you know, harnessing whatever it is they're interested in doing and having opportunities for kids to find ways to do that, putting them in marketplaces. You know, I love the fact that when I have a project with a school, we have a, a true failure option. Um, you know, we can fail. Stash culinary can fail. We can totally blow it and lose a lot of money. Um, I have kids all the time that are doing work for do rad things, you know, where it's like, all right, let's take this. The brand is the vehicle now. So now let's find a way for you to uh, create a t-shirt, market that t-shirt, sell that t-shirt. And I'll give the kids the profit. If they made money, they get the money. Um, making education real, I think is kind of the, to wrap all of that into one concept, really making education realistic experiences, you know, very real, not just experiential learning, but real, real. Yeah. The bottom line is real and <laughs> taking experiential learning, the next step, really putting some actual risk involved. Um, you know, you, you learn how to, you, you, in skateboarding and things like that. And, and, and a lot of the action sports you learn through pain. I mean, that's how you figure out how to do things correctly is by crashing. And so I think that's an opportunity or not necessarily an opportunity, but something I think that we need to put more of in education, less safety nets and more, let's figure this out. Yeah. I think two big takeaways for me, and I hopefully, hopefully the listeners get these too, is like that, that making education real piece, I think is powerful, making it have an impact and you're feeling kind of those ups and downs of yeah. success and failure. I think that's a valuable tool that maybe we're missing out on. And then the second one was, oh man, I got too deep in the first one. What was the second one I just had? Um, oh, allowing students to be okay with following their passion and then putting that intellectual property behind it. You know, I think sometimes, obviously, we've seen it through friends and, you know, the world that passions are kind of muted or stunted mm -hmm. for the drive of just, hey, falling in line and doing what you think others think you should do. But hey, like, let's follow your passion and give it a shot. Like, you can always go to college, you can always get a nine to five, but, you know, taking that shot at real happiness and influence and doing what you want to do is so powerful. And I love that message that yeah. you're demonstrating yourself and then you're also sharing with students and that it's just so yeah. powerful, man. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's, you're at the best time of your life to try when in high school, you know, and, and in, a, in your younger adult life, I mean, there's no better time to try and, and experience and go out and do these things. The older you get, the harder it is to make these dramatic life changes. So yeah, you get responsibilities that are no fun. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Well, man, I really appreciate it. I think we're like 50 minutes in it. Amazing conversation. I love getting to know 
the drive and thoughts and passion behind your work that I've seen online and, and I've just kind of seen the surface level. So I, I really appreciate your time. I think everyone's going to get a ton out of this. Where can people follow you? I know you got so many things going on. Where, yeah. where do you want people to go? Uh, yeah, well, thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm honored to honored to be chatting with you and uh, having these conversations is important. You know, I think the more people that hear these types of things, the better the better we all become, especially as educators. So, um, uh, yeah, you can hit me up um, in, anywhere, really. Instagram is kind of the number one. I, I, you know, in terms of social media right now, the Instagram is sort of where it's all sort of happening. So uh, I have I have several. I have uh, Stage Culinary. It's spelled like stage, stage culinary. Um, yep. Stage Culinary is kind of the cooking type stuff. Obviously, that's the more food-based. Um, Durad Things is, is the brand itself. And, um, you know, just a quick note on the brand. Um, this is, we're going to be developing this as an actual brand. And what I'd like to be doing with the brand is putting it into the hands of students when we can, where they're part of a project, whether it's a t-shirt design or whatever. Um, but all profits from Stage, or from uh, Durad Things, rather, um, are, are going to go back towards trying to find ways to fund creative, interesting, experiential learning platforms. So when you buy a Durad Things hat, you're supporting the Stodge Culinary Project. Um, you know, it's it's a nonprofit and it isn't a nonprofit in its own way. We want it to be a profitable brand, but we also want that money to go towards um, uh, making sure that we're we're, we're putting we're, we're, the whole point of it is that we're building better educational scenarios for kids. And so uh, Durad Things on Instagram at Durad Things, obviously. Uh, at Red Things Co. Company, um, at Stodge Culinary. And then mine is just at Rivard Art. That's my my own artwork, kind of my own personal musings. Um, you know, I try to keep it PG, not always, but, uh, you know, um, that's been a big struggle. You can only do your best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting thing like that, that I learned early on when I started working with kids is that I was an artist before I was an educator. And I came from a skateboard background and, you know, a little bit more of a hardcore background that, that's I definitely had to learn how to, how to do a little bit of the censorship with that, which I'm not a fan of. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's the Rivard art is kind of my, my main channel, but um, also uh, do red things.net stodge culinary.com uh, mark of postal express.com. So several websites there, but uh, really anything search do red things for anything. And, and you're kind of all funnels back to me. Yeah, guys, be sure to check them out. I just got a hat, a shirt, some stickers. It's, amazing quality. It's, it's just awesome. And it's a, a super cool brand. So be sure to support that. Uh, hopefully we can do stuff and work together in the future to get some more visibility on that. Um, man, I appreciate your time and yeah, guys, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. 